Uh, our next two speakers are going to talk about something fun, as they say. Uh, so say hello to Sara and Milan, and who enjoy the talk. All right, let's start. So hi, everyone. My name is Milan Savic. My name is Sara Pellegrini. And we gathered here today to share some unpleasant truths about distributed systems. Yes, indeed, once upon a time, there was the monolith. It was heavy, not really user-friendly, with a lot of limitation, but it also had some benefits. It was easy to deploy, easy to debug uh, every mm, component into a single deployable unit. Unfortunately, uh, the modern application became more and more demanding uh, in terms of uh, flexibility, high availability, scalability, and not always the monolith could keep up with uh, these increased needs. So, fortunately for us, we found a solution for all the problems. Yes, and the solution is, since the year is 2022 now, is microservices that will solve all possible problems in software world, maybe even wider. So, joking aside, uh, here we have a representation of microservice world. We have several islands. Uh, they are well instructed. Uh, uh, they uh, can be deployed differently. They can be built in different languages uh, by different teams, scaled out differently, etc., etc. But in order to complete any meaningful business transaction, we need to have a communication between uh, these islands, basically between our microservices, and it. I mean, on this uh, sunny day, it looks pretty uh, easy and simple, but there might be something under the surface. Yeah. When you start looking under the surface, the problem begins. And uh, dealing with distributed system has several challenges. Challenges uh, that are specifically related to the communication between these uh, microservices, these autonomous services. The network could be temporarily available. The other services uh, could be unavailable uh, as well. So a lot of different problems that were not there when we were dealing with the monolith. So what we need to do is to introduce additional complexity in our systems in order to deal with these problems. So the question is, is it really worth it? And the answer depends. So before answering that question, uh, we must remember the very first rule of distributed systems. Does anyone know what that rule is? No? <laughs> yes, don't distribute your systems. <laughs> yeah, so basically, if you don't have any needs to start your new project uh, in a microservices fashion, in a distributed systems fashion, please don't do it because you will just introduce a lot of complexity in your domain without any special needs. So today, Sarah and I uh, prepared several ch challenges when it comes to distributed systems, and we have some solutions uh, to propose to those challenges. We, of course, couldn't extract all of them. Um, we just extracted ones that we think are the, the most interesting to share. Um, this talk usually is a little bit longer. However, the format of this conference is a little bit shorter, so we Extracting, extracted only one set of issues, uh, and we have them under the umbrella of message dispatching. Yeah. So message dispatching, the first major problem that you need, uh, that you have when you're dealing with distributed system is message dispatching. And you need to um, build your application uh, in a way that they are resilient to the communication pitfalls. So let's uh, introduce, in order to understand better the solution that we are going to propose, a sample use case that will accompany us through all the presentation. We have uh, an e-commerce system that is built through a um, system of distributed microservices. Each of them has its own responsibility. And uh, we want to talk about message-driven application today. So, what happens when a user decides to confirm an order? Typically, in a message-driven application, a confirm order command is uh, sent to the component, to the microservice, that is responsible for handling this command. If the order can be confirmed, this component will publish an event, a order confirmed event. And uh, all the other components that are interested in this event will receive this event and uh, they will react accordingly to their responsibility. 
uh, one component can, for example, send an email back to the customer, and other components can update uh, projections on the database. So after some time, the shipment uh, department um, want to retrieve all the orders that can be shipped. And for this reason, the system sends a query to a specific component that can answer this question. So, as you can uh, already notice, when we talk about message-driven application, we distinguish among three main kind of messages. And that is true. As Sarah already mentioned, there are three types of messages that we distinguish here in our, in our system. Uh, the first type uh, is commands. So commands represent an intent to change something within our system. They are routed to a single component. Usually the component is a command handler in certain aggregate, doesn't have to be, can be completely independent. Um, the res result of handling this command is usually something that we are not that interested in. Uh, we just want to know whether the system accepted command or not. The second type of messages that we have in our systems is events. Uh, we route them in a, a pub-sub fashion, so all, to all interested components. Events essentially represent the fact that something relevant has happened within our system. And we absolutely do not care about uh, whether they are handled successfully or not. We take um, that responsibility further to the consumers of those events, so consumers can define the pace in which they want to consume those events and uh, process them further. The last type of messages that we have here in front of us uh, is queries. Uh, queries uh, represent an intent to, uh, to get the information from the system, to get the current state of the system. They can be routed, as you can see here, to a single component or to several components, depending on what type of query you want to run. Maybe in certain cases you want to run a broadcast query to all uh, possible components that we have in our system and gather the result, provide some reduction function to get something meaningful out of it. So it really depends uh, on the type of message, how we want to route, uh, how we want to route them. We have them lined out here, and now you may wonder, okay, now I just need to use the proper type of the message. I'm in my distributed system. Uh, what can possibly go wrong? Essentially, there are a lot of things that go wrong, and now we are going to put our focus on those. The very first one is... Yeah, the very first co pr common problem that you will face when you are dealing with distributed system is that the message uh, is not delivered, doesn't reach its destination. And this can happen for several different reasons. For example, the network is unreliable or the other components is unavailable. So let's say that uh, a customer wants to buy something on our e-commerce system. So what happens when it clicks the um, buy button? So many things happen. At a certain point, the system wants to send a, a request payment command to the component that is responsible to perform the transaction, the business transaction. So normally, uh, this command reach its destination, and as a consequence, the business transaction is performed, and a confirmation is sent back to the first component. But it can happen in less fortunate cases that the first component does not re receive any uh, confirmation. So the reason we said they could be different, but mm, whatever the reason is, one first strategy we can adopt is to introduce a retry mechanism. So a retry mechanism that allows our infrastructure, infrastructure component, to send again the same request, the same message, whenever uh, the first component does not receive any confirmation or if it receives an explicit error. So this is a first technical solution that we can use to tackle the, pro the, the problem of message not delivered. As you can see here, we use this uh, particular symbol to identify all technical solutions and to differentiate them uh, from the design solution for the same problem. So let's see now how we can uh, tackle this problem from the business logic point of view, from the design point of view. Yeah, so when it comes to design, one of the things that we can do here is to set a deadline, which is really specific to our domain and also the way how we are going to handle it is really specific to our do domain. So uh, we want to do the same here. We have a customer who wants to buy something within our online product and we need, as an online shop, to request a payment toward our payment provider. 
But before doing so, we are going to set a deadline, a time for how long we are comfortable with waiting for requests to be sent and reply to be received. We are going to send it, but unfortunately our payment provider is for some reason unavailable or it cannot respond. What will happen here is that basically the deadline will tick, and now what we need to do is something that is called the saga pattern. Um, we are just going to composite the original action, right? Uh, in our case, comp composition is canceling the original order, and now it really de de depends on your domain what this action is going to be and how you're going to implement. In certain cases, uh, the action can be several steps, and you need to go back and composite several of them back. So this is a design solution. We are using a completely different icon for that one uh, because basically how you are going to handle this line really, uh, deadline really depends on your uh, domain. So let's see now another challenge. Yeah, this is another challenge. Message delivered multiple times. And bear in mind that this problem could also be caused by the retry mechanism that we introduced before. In fact, when you are in a distributed system, when a component sends a message to another component, it is basically impossible for uh, the first component to understand why it doesn't receive any confirmation. It can be that uh, the message never reached its destination, but it could also be that the message reached the destination and has been perfectly performed, but the confirmation is not able to come back to the first component. For that reason, the only way we can tackle this problem is or the only way we can make our application resilient is to make our application tolerant to multiple sending of the same message. So let's say how we can do that. One first solution is to make your message idempotent. What does idempotence mean? Idempotence is a property of a function um, that no matter how many times you invoke this function, you achieve always the same result. So let's say that a customer wants to buy one banana and uh, after some time, he changes his mind and decide to buy two bananas. So what uh, the system can do is to send a increment item num number command. As a consequence, uh, the increment item number is, execu is executed and the number of banana in the cart goes from one to two. But what happens if this command is delivered twice by mistake. The second time the increment item number is executed and the number of bananas in the car goes from two to three. And this is not what we want. So the problem is that the increment item number is not an idempotent message. So what we can do to solve the same problem using a semantically different command that can be handled in an idempotent way. We can change the command using an update item number. So in this case, the first time the command contains the uh, update value. So when it is executed, the item number goes from one to two. But if by mistake, the same command is delivered twice, the consequences are not really important because the uh, number of bananas in the car goes from two to two again. So this uh, is uh, uh, an extremely powerful tool to make your um, application uh, really resilient. Uh, design your message to um, make your ex their execution idempotent is a really powerful tool. So let's see, and it is a design solution in this case, of course. Let's see now another solution to tackle the same problem. So the other thing that we can do is just to check uh, the current state of the system. So we have uh, command to confirm a certain order, and in this case, we must denote that uh, each order is uniquely identifiable. So we have uh, a command to confirm the order. We are going to load up the correct aggregate to handle this command. Um, as a consequence, we are going to fire up uh, order confirmed event, uh, and uh, that's it, right? The state of the order aggregate is confirmed. But for some reasons, it can happen that uh, we received the uh, command again, right? Again, uh, I am underlining that we have unique identities, so the same aggregate will be loaded, and the state of that aggregate is just confirmed. So in order to prevent further validation of the command, further 
uh, execution and publication of events, what we can do is just ignore it, right? This is something that is already handled. It makes no sense to handle it again. So this is a solution we, that we call uh, compare and swap. You may already know this from programming languages such as Java, C Sharp, I know. Uh, while there it is a technical solution uh, because you can use technical terms to uh, to solve your uh, business problem. Here we call it a design solution because it really depends on your domain how you are going to implement this specific technique. With that, we are going to move to the next challenge and, uh, in, in a message dispatching area, and that challenge is that messages can be delivered in the wrong order. Uh, reasons for that could be various. So maybe we are not using the, the right protocol. Maybe we are using UDP instead of TCP because of uh, performance. Uh, or maybe just the structure of our system and communication between our components is done in a way that even if we are using the protocol that has uh, guarant uh, order guarantees, we cannot enforce uh, ordering across several communication channels. So uh, let's consider again our a uh, famous case. We want to confirm the order and we want to request the payment. Uh, if everything is done in the order that we expect, we don't have any issues, right? We have a happy customer. Uh, we are happy as an online store. We got payment. A customer uh, has uh, its uh, goods delivered. But now for a certain uh, um, network config configuration of various reasons. It could happen that those are received in different order, the order that we do not expect them to be received. If everything is handled successfully, again, there is no problem, right? But what happens if order has not been confirmed? In that case, I mean, for us as an online store, it is a really good situation because we got the money, but our user didn't get the, the stuff that uh, he or she ordered. But for users, this is not such a good case. And let's say we want to be ethical and we want to solve this issue. So what we are going to do is a really simple solution is just to chain our messages, right? It will have a little bit of impact uh, when it comes to uh, performance, but it will have the solution correct. So first of all, we are going to confirm the order. Uh, once the order is confirmed, then we are going to send the request payment. So it is really important not to paralyze in this situation because it really impacts our, um, our business case. This is obviously a design solution and we are going to list it here as chain messages. Yeah, and someone might wonder why don't we use a, a transport protocol that can enforce the ordering of messages? And Yes, in some time this is possible. For example, if we use a TCP channel, we can enforce the correct ordering of the messages sent from the orange component to the blue one. But what happens if we need to scale up the blue component? In this case, we have two TCP channels. They are uh, operating concurrently and there are no way to enforce the ordering because uh, they are completely autonomous and independent. So one strategy we can use in this uh, case is uh, to decide to dispatch uh, the order to one or the other component accordingly to the sequentiality that we want to obtain. Basically, uh, we can use a consistent hashing algorithm using as a key, the key that represents the sequentiality that we want to maintain. Uh, in our e-commerce example, we can say all the messages that are related to even customer codes will be dispatched to the first instance. All the messages that have odd customer code will be dispatched to the second instance because we don't care about the sequentiality of messages that are related to different customers. We are only interested in maintaining the sequentiality for the same customer. So this is um, a solution that you can adopt in a certain business case, but not always. For example, what if we decide instead of scaling up the blue component to split the blue component in two different components, the black one and the green one, and each of them is able to handle only a certain kind of messages, not everything. So in this way, if there are two messages that uh, uh, must necessarily be delivered uh, to two different components, we cannot 
in any way enforce the sequentiality between uh, these two. So in these cases, for example, we cannot use uh, a transport protocol capable of um, guaranteeing the order in order to um, guarantee the messaging, the sequentiality in messaging execution. So the transport protocol together with a consistent hashing algorithm or other technique can be useful, but they must always be accompanied by design solution, like for example, chaining the messages in order to uh, cover properly these problems of message delivery in the wrong order. Let's see now what happens when we need to change our non-functional requirements or infrastructure requirements. Yeah, we don't call them non-functional because we want our system to function. So if you want to change our infrastructural uh, uh, requirements or maybe you want to change the team organization, we want, for example, this red component to be de uh, deployed differently, in, uh, built in different programming language, maintained by a different team, or maybe we just want to uh, have it scaled out differently. Maybe this is our order component and it is getting traction, so it gets more load. So instead of scaling out the whole, the, the whole application, we can extract our uh, order component and we can scale it out differently, only that one. Uh, what is important to note here is that uh, our infrastructure changes, but that does not mean that our business logic changes. So we want to lock any, uh, co any code changes that are related to our business logic. The only thing that we want to do is just to change the infrastructure. And there is one really interesting concept here that will help us to achieve uh, such a, a scaling out scenario, and it is called location transparency. Yeah, location transparency is a very powerful concept. It's a technique that requires your component to not be aware of the location of all the other components they interact with. Even more, a component should not be even aware of the existence of other components. So the only thing that a component can do is to express its need, sending commands to the rest of the world, or for example, expressing effect, sending events to the rest of the world. But it should not care uh, about who is interested in uh, receiving and handling these messages. Let's see how it works in practice. Yeah, let's try to put it in practice. We have here two components. They want to communicate with each other. One of the things that we can do is just send a direct message from a purple to a blue component. And now, as you may see, this is not really location transparent because the purple component needs to know about the location of the blue component. Um, so we want to do something else here. What we can do is to introduce another uh, infrastructural component. So this one has nothing to do with our business. Uh, we're going to call it a message bus, and it basically is responsible for delivering messages from one component to the other. Another benefit that we are going to get here is that now we can cl uh, have clear boundaries between our components. It's also important to have in mind that now the API, uh, maybe it was not so apparent from the beginning, the API of our components are messages now, right? So what uh, Purple Component needs to know uh, is only the types of messages that can be handled. It does not have to know who can handle them, which component can handle them, uh, how it is implemented, or any internal details. So it only needs to know the API it is interested in. So this uh, message bus is going to deliver messages. Once, uh, so if they are in the same uh, deployable unit, this implementation of this message bus will be one. If we want to scale out to a uh, distributed environment, then we can change the implementation of the message bus, the only thing that is needed to be changed. Yeah, this is a very powerful tool because it allows us to evolve the infrastructure during time when the needs are right and not before. So um, without modifying the business logic, a single line of business logic code, this is also very important. So when you start a new project, normally it does not really make sense to go for a distributed uh, system. You don't want to deal with this complexity at the very beginning. You want to have uh, the system functioning without dealing with the complexity of the distribution. So what you want to do is to build a single, a monolithic application, but well-structured internally. Internally, you should, you should uh, define uh, the components that can interact 
uh, with each other through messages. And uh, during this first implementation, you can use a message bus that is able to deliver messages inside the same executable. So you can use a uh, very reliable instance of uh, the message bus. But if you later want to, uh, for example, scale up the red component because you need more uh, performance in this regard, what you can do is to simply switch the implementation of the message bus because the yellow message bus that we have in this representation is not suitable anymore because it was able only to deliver messages inside the same executable. But another instance uh, can be able, for example, to deliver messages also outside this, the executable in a distributed environment. So this is a very powerful tool and um, it starts uh, defining the proper API. Uh, so an API that is able to uh, distinguish very clearly the business logic code from the infrastructural code, from the components that uh, is uh, responsible for delivering the messages, and this is named message bus. And then uh, this allows us to evolve the infrastructure whenever the needs arise. And uh, last but not least, the last problem we normally yeah, The think. problem is something that we <laughs> usually do only when we deploy it to production. So Sarah and I, I know, some, somehow consequentially uh, put that in our slides as the very last thing, so performance, right? This is something that we worry about uh, only when we complete everything. So the, the reasons for having a bad performance are also really network related. Uh, could be uh, also that um, just by nature our component, single component system can be slow because, I mean, the uh, certain payments cannot be done sooner or something else, some other business requirement. Uh, the only solution that we're going to propose here uh, is a streaming. Uh, this is basically change in our API. So instead of using uh, request reply API, we are going to introduce two uh, uh, st uh, streams of messages between those two components. So we're going to have two communication channels. Uh, just but, uh, by not, uh, just by losing the overhead of opening a new connection every time, sending the headers and metadata every time uh, for our requests, we are going to improve our performance when it comes to uh, uh, communication a lot. Uh, but we have to worry now about the uh, correlation between request and response. Not such a big deal, but still we have to have it in mind. Uh, not all protocols support streaming, but it is really important to know that when you're building API, it is much better to support streaming right away. Uh, backport uh, to the protocol does, does not support streaming if for some reason you cannot choose uh, a protocol there that supports it. Uh, because then when you are able to have advantages of streaming, you don't have to change the API. API stays the same, you just change the underlying uh, protocol. So that's why, because we need to take care about the streaming, that's why we are um, listing this as a design solution. With this, we completed all challenges that we wanted to present and all uh, solutions to them, and we want to uh, give you something to take away. Yeah, because we presented several problems, and the solution that uh, most commonly we use to solve this problem, but there is a common denominator that we think is important, a message that uh, it's in our opinion, uh, the thing that you should take away from this talk. Uh, we've seen two uh, types of solutions that we have. One's are technical solutions, while the others are design solutions. We usually, as developers, software engineers, we try to seek for the technical solution right away because we don't want to talk to our business, we don't want to spend time doing something not interesting. But <laughs> while sometimes it is much better to, to seek for the design solution, to talk to our business, maybe talking to them, we can see that something can be implemented differently and can save us a lot of time. And that's it, I guess. Thank you for attending.